Howdy. Howdy. Well, welcome to the end of a very long weekend to the inaugural edition of Aggies and Vent. I'd like to welcome all of the students. Y'all have been absolutely outstanding throughout the entire weekend. Um, for those of you who are in the audience and those of you who are on air, you're going to see really some very amazing projects. But more impressive is you'll see the cooperation amongst many different disciplines of engineering, a cooperation between the College of Engineering and the College of Medicine, because we had medical students here as well, and we have freshmen through PhD candidates. Basically, we gave everyone need statements, and they'll talk about what their need statement is and what challenge we gave them. Ask them to design, to develop teams, and then to develop a prototype in 48 hours. You're going to be amazed at what our students have been able to accomplish in a 48 hour period. Howdy. Howdy. Well, welcome to the end of a <laughs> slight technical difficulty. We're going to get rid of the audio here in just a second. Unless I can hear myself over there. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to introduce a few honored guests that we have here, some of them on our judging panel. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Dale Cope. He's the Director of Industry Assistance in Tees. Um, he is one of the people that will help us commercialize some of our ideas. Um, Dr. Lagudis, Dr. Dimitri Lagudis is in the back back there. Uh, he's the Senior Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering. Uh, Dr. Anand's right here. Dr. Anand is uh, an executive dean of, uh, of, with the College of Engineering. We have uh, Dr. Emily Wilson, who is part of the uh, Department of Medical and Physiology, and Dr. David Zwaja. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I was close. Pretty close. close. Pretty close, okay. Thank you very much for the College of Medicine. So we, we are very pleased that both of y'all are here. And uh, Dr. Valerie Taylor, who is the Dean of the Engineering, Academic, and Student Affairs Office, is part of, that's actually hosting most of this. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. John Mumford, who is the Vice Chancellor of Research for Texas A&M University System, and he's going to be one of our judges. Uh, another honored guest we have is Dr. Paul Ogden. Uh, Dr. Ogden is the uh, Dean of the College of Medicine. Um, so I'm not going to introduce all of the, oh, I forgot. Um, uh, Dr. Njeti, Dr. Prasad Njeti, who is uh, an associate dean with our with our organization as well. So thank you very much. And I also want to introduce Michael Lagudis. Michael Lagudis is the head of our organization and uh, has really helped us out putting things a lot together. And I think uh, Michael, you wanted to say a few words. Thank you. Howdy. Howdy. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all the students. This was a dream. Can this work? Would we be able to get some students come here in the summer and spend so many hours with us? And we are excited to see you come, and we're excited to see you work that hard. Some of you stayed until 5.30 in the morning. But then I wanted also to thank the people who helped us pull some of the students from different departments, some of the students from different colleges. I would like to recognize the faculty. Uh, so we have some faculty. I'm sorry, I remember only first name, Satish. From industrial engineering. Thank you. And I know we had Dr. Porter here because they are the ones who helped us push these events. And of course, Dr. Mockford, who has spent so many hours with our students, interacting with students. This was an initiative that Dr. Taylor, Dr. Anand have supported us, and we would like to see more of that. So as you leave today and you look at this experience, Please give us your input and let us know how can we design these programs so that they would be of benefit. Rodney has been talking and has posted around what we call the entrepreneurial mindset. How can we help you, some, help you get some skills that will guide you in those areas if that's what you choose? We have lots of students. 9,000 students will not come here, but we're looking for those who want to use this opportunity. So as a last point is, Give us your feedback with a survey. Let us know what kind of things you are interested so we can put forward. We have two more events, new events coming up in the fall. We would like to get your feedback to design them so they are all value to you. 
and with that, I'll turn it over to Roger. So good luck to all the teams who are looking forward. You work very hard. Just focus on what worked, not what didn't work, and do the best, right? All of you did an awesome job. Thank you, Marco. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank our sponsors of the event. We've had a number of sponsors um, of the event. Some of them provided us with uh, technology. Some of them find, provided us with uh, funds uh, between Intel, St. Joseph's, uh, Teneris, Texas Children's Hospital, uh, Confluence Ventures, Pico, Freescale, as well as NASA. Each one of them provided us with uh, some uh, technology or um, financial support or both or mentors. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Uh, Tony Mong, who is right here. Uh, Tony came from Dallas. We had a happen chance uh, where we met earlier, and he's been a mentor throughout this entire weekend and has helped each one of the teams. So I want to uh, say thank you very much to you coming as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the first team. You all have 10 minutes. Uh, let's go. The judging starts now. Wonderful. Thank you. Can I say the judging starts now? <laughs> <laughs> so hi, uh, thank you guys for giving us this opportunity to put on this presentation. Uh, we are good baby. So the issue at hand. Across the United States, a number of incidents have happened where children have been left trapped inside hot vehicles. Uh, this picture over here is an example of a life flight medical team uh, carrying an infant to a hospital. Um, I wanted to start by asking, if any of you walked past a car that had a child trapped inside of it, how many of you would not hesitate to break the window? So uh, that actually did happen in this case. Unfortunately, the child passed away uh, shortly after reaching the hospital. Believe it or not, this happened two hours this past Friday before we sat down to talk about this Aggies event. Uh, event. So. Um, the cases or the scenarios in which this happens are wide and varied. Uh, there's lots of situations, every economic class, every social class, uh, people from all across the United States have had this happen to them. Sometimes the child will be sit sleeping inside of a car seat, sometimes the child will be playing around inside of the car. There's no standard issue where something like this happens. Inside of a car, the temperature skyrockets pretty rapidly. With environmental temperatures of 85 degrees or higher, if the car is in direct sunlight, the car can reach about 110 degrees Fahrenheit in less than 10 minutes. So a car heats up pretty quickly. Uh, heat stroke uh, happens at about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So a number of uh, technologies currently exist in order to help remind parents uh, that their child is inside of their vehicle and that they need to be removed. Uh, this ranges from apps to smart car seats to a number of other technologies. The issue is the NHTSA has refused to endorse any of these products. The reason being, a lot of these products are not very reliable. How many of you have been sent a text message by someone only to never receive it? Or how many of you have received a text message only to not check it for a few hours later? What we have done is we've come up with an innovative way of combating this and making sure that as many lives are saved as possible. With that, I'd like to introduce our team. Uh, my name is Yusuf. I am a first year medical student. I'm Gabriel Aguilar. I'm a junior aerospace engineering major. I'm Daniel Whitten, a senior mechanical engineering student. Sean Whitney, a junior aerospace engineering major. I'm going to answer your PhD in chemical engineering. And I'll let Sean talk a little bit about our innovation. Right, so you heard that we have a very specific way that we are going to combat the average difficulty overcoming text messages. And that is what we saw in our preliminary research for this need statement was a common theme, is that for as many cases that you, that you have a child dying in heat stroke uh, in a car, you also have someone coming to the aid of that child successfully and rescuing them and preventing a loss of life. And so what we chose to do is we chose to tap into the goodwill of surrounding people in that situation what, and a system that we call the Good Samaritan Network. And essentially, te technically how we do this is we use a combination of geofencing, which is a virtual perimeter around a real world area that's already in use 
in like in the retail industry for doorbuster sales and things like that, you get a text message. In combination with the FCC wireless emergency alert system, which is what governs Amber Alerts, tornado, hurricane, weather, lightning strikes, things like that. And uh, so what the Good Baby system is, is it, it's an all-inclusive package that includes a set of sensors as well as a uh, cellular communication device. So uh, this would mount to the roof of your car, and uh, what it would do is it would prevent uh, children forgotten in the car and uh, children playing in the car from uh, being trapped in potentially dangerous and hot uh, environments. So uh, how this works is that uh, as soon as a child is detected in the car and the temperature is in excess of around 95 degrees, a text message will be sent to the parent. Um, as soon as uh, the parent receives that text message, they'll have three minutes to respond to this alert. Uh, they do not respond within that three minute time frame. A, uh, the emergency services will immediately be notified and uh, the Good Samaritan Network would be started. And uh, the Good Samaritan Network would be anyone located within the geofence of uh, the Good Baby system. So, so in the last 48 hours, we have created a prototype of the Good Baby system. Um, our prototype includes three sensors, temperature, proximity, and uh, motion. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is that our product features this motion detection, which would allow our product to help the approximately 50% of the cases of death in which the baby was not actually in the car seat. So that's an important thing. So we have our Aggie baby here. Um, uh, as any Aggie parent would, is very decked out in Aggie clothing. Now, uh, our Aggie baby is in front of our sensors. If you probably can't see, but we have these lights showing that we are detecting either proximity or motion. Now, right now, our baby is in you know acceptable uh, temperature limits, so everything's fine. However, let's say he is uh, left in a car or some other uh, problem occurs and things start to heat up, which I'll represent with this heat gun. Now, a red light was just set, it was just triggered, which indicates that an a unacceptable temperature limit was just set. Now, um, our parent here, who was maybe distracted um, and has, has received a text message telling him that this has happened. However, maybe he's distracted, maybe he didn't see it. So all the rest of us are going to be receiving messages as part of the Good Samaritan Network. We're going to be receiving messages also that tells us this is occurring and also has a link to a, uh, a Google Maps link showing us where this is occurring. Uh, so that is our prototype um, for this weekend. And it's not a conspiracy. Mr. Uh, Rodney <laughs> Bam also got the text message. I got two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we, then we were planning to send our alarm systems to another screen more uh, applications. The first one is subscriber. So first, we want to uh, we want to involve the cellular network in a particular store, like HEV or whatever, to involve okay, all the customer in the store to into our voice metric system to get all of them be potential resource rescue baby from the car. And the second one will be the pad detection. We can integrate our alarm system into a chip or polar wire by your pad or puppy or whatever. So we won't read the signals of a puppy die in a hot in a hot car those signals anymore. And the third one is personal alarm, so a person could find himself in a potential danger situation could after the our system our alarm alert system just by wearing a jewelry which has some built in so if he can get he can get the help from the people surrounding him more efficient. So just to tie things together, what we're doing is we're decreasing the chances of children being left in hot cars by increasing the number of people getting uh, an alert and tapping into the natural goodwill of the people around us. So at this time, uh, thank you guys very much for this opportunity once again. And we'd like to open up the floor for questions if we're allowed to do so. Five minutes for questions. Yes. Um, does, does the detection still work while driving? Because if uh, what would happen if the parent is driving and they're not paying attention to their phone? Would an emergency responder still be sent out for the driving vehicle? Well, assuming, okay, so you probably would be using air conditioning in your vehicle. So the <laughs> system is only triggered if the, if the critical temperature is reached. If, if you're driving in a conditions where it was so hot that it would be dangerous for your child, uh, that would be uh, unusual. Good question. Go ahead. What contingencies do you have if you're not connected to a cell network? Sure. Um, so I guess that is one you know limitation of this design. 
However, we're also interested in um, one thing that we didn't talk about too much, but we were interested in developing was some sort of prevention network or a prevention system such that maybe it's just a little a buzzer or a light on your door, just so that it's a, you know, a, it's not the best system, but it would just still be a little bit of a visual or auditory indication before you even use the vehicle. Another possible solution is that installing some type of transmitter inside of a vehicle. Unfortunately, technology will not allow us to do that. Those systems are pretty expensive. Uh, but one would hope in the future perhaps something like that would be possible. To that, to that end also, uh, since the system is also based on external response from people, most likely a mobile network would be present where people are. Like, I believe you had a question? Yes. So you said this is this will be placed on the inside and the roof of the car? Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about where, I guess, the sensitivity of where it's placed so it's not so close to the window or things like that? Sure. So yeah, it's, it's important, especially because we're using uh, a motion sensor, we would have to select a sensor that would uh, allow a field of view to cover, um, especially the front two seats of a, of a maybe a normal vehicle, but also we have to limit it so that it doesn't uh, detect anything outside of the car, because that wouldn't be very useful. So that would be one limitation for sure. Is so what, um, the thing is, uh, with a little bit of research, any number or any set of sensors could be installed in the vehicle. Our primary in innovation is that Good Samaritan network. So rather than having uh, the pre-existing systems which only reach out to the parent or some caretaker, we would be reaching out to emergency services and to people in the immediate vicinity of the vehicle. Yes? Could the, could the system be uh, geared to some network like OnStar that would automatically unlock the car doors, so you wouldn't have to smash the windows. Sure. So yeah. it, 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 cer okay. it certainly could, sir. Uh, that though, we try to stray away from something that could be that was too specific towards a specific brand, um, because once you when you move into that area, you have integration, different responsibilities that are that are associated with integration that would change based on depending on the brand of the car, but it's certainly possible. Some of the research that we did showed that um, over the last few years, the percentage of cars that are over 10 years old has increased sharply, partly due to the financial collapse. So if I remember correctly, over 30% of cars on the road are approximately 14, 15 years old. And so uh, we wanted to have a system that was as universal as possible without having to tie in to a specific brand. And um, how much more time do we have? About two more questions. Uh, so, yeah, so I guess as far as the temperature sensor, that would be a good one as far as you know a, a typical problem for monitoring health. But it certainly wouldn't be limited. Maybe it's a baby that has um, other conditions. Maybe they need to have heart monitor or things like that. Um, Carbon dioxide sensors could be another mm -hmm. one. So yeah, that would be probably a little bit more difficult to implement, but as far as our general system is together, it could definitely be integrated with any uh, other types of sensors and used in conjunction with the Good Samaritan members. And one more question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The question I have is about uh, false positives. How do you make sure when a proximity sensor or a motion sensor detects something, it's actually it's detecting because there's a baby in the car and not because something is kind of moving as a result of temperature. So, uh, one of the re uh, I flipped back to this flowchart. Uh, this was sort of what we came up with. Um, it's not a finalized flowchart, but it was part of our process when you're putting this together. Uh, we discussed that scenario a little bit, and our solution was having sustained response as opposed to uh, one time motion detection. So, a kid that would be playing inside of a vehicle. Uh, you'll be able to have maybe one or two minutes of continuous motion detection before we send out the alarm, as opposed to like somebody walking past a vehicle. Um, as far as uh, the child sitting inside of the crib, we have continuous notification of the child sitting inside the crib, because one would assume that the child is buckled into the crib. So thank you very much uh, once again for this opportunity. We're excited to see the rest of your presentation. All right, as the next group gets um, set up, I wanted to just also recognize um, uh, Cameron Owens, who's sitting, sitting back there. Cam is from Coralware, and Cameron was also one of our mentors throughout the entire weekend, and Cameron has been just outstanding. Are, are y'all going to come up? Or, come, on, come on, guys. Let's keep, let's keep this flowing, because uh, we want to get through all the presentations. Um, 
So Cameron's been outstanding and, and has really helped us out tremendously throughout this entire weekend as well. Ron, you're good? Yes, cool. Okay. Hello, my name is Austin Hahn, uh, and I'm representing our team, Lightronics, today. I bet some of you are wondering why we have uh, the T in our name uh, colored blue, and uh, we'll find out soon. So how many of you have ever, have ever experienced impaired performance, poor, poor uh, concentration, headaches, difficulty sleeping, or daytime drowsiness? Uh, my guess is many of us, and especially us students here today. So I bet many of you didn't know that one of the major problems of this is the amount of light our body receives throughout the day. So we're going to talk a little bit today about that problem. Before we get to that, I'd like to go over a brief agenda. We're going to talk about our project overview. We're going to talk about our project goals and objectives. We're going to go through our design process. We're going to talk about our final design. We're going to give a demonstration of our uh, prototype. And we're going to talk about our future potential. So NASA, one of our sponsors, has set out a need statement for us today. And they are looking for a device to monitor the amount of light in space for maintaining circadian rhythms for their NASA crew members. So what this is asking, they are asking for us to monitor the amount of light that, that they are exposed to throughout a day so that they can monitor their sleep cycles uh, effectively. Some of the requirements they are looking for today. They want to look at the ability to log in light intensity and spectral data. They also need wireless communication between the base uh, and the device. So here are our team goals and our product overview. Our primary goal is to develop a wearable light sensor system <coughs> to study light degradation in space. This system will also be able to specifically locate which lights may or may not be experiencing malfunctions uh, that could be uh, detrimental to an astronaut's health. So here's a little background on light degradation. Many of you probably are a little confused by that term. It is simply the decline of light intensity and the shift in spectrum ratios over time. So what does this mean? If we look at the charts over here up on the monitors, you can notice that over time, the light intensity uh, declines down as the uh, hardware begins to malfunction slightly. Uh, the key here to notice, though, is that over time, the blue light ratio begins to increase. And blue light ratio is critical in determining uh, mood. Blue light is essential, uh, is essential component of our mood. And the way our bodies react to our circadian rhythm is that our bodies uh, absorb light through the eyes. And that light absorption uh, kind of indicates to our body our sleep cycle and kind of gets us into a routine of, of hormone release. Uh, and, and many of those things can affect our sleep cycle. And many of these side effects are what I began uh, the presentation with drowsiness, poor concentration, and headaches. So as a group, we took a, our, a design process of two phases. The first phase was hardware, software, and development. And the second phase was device packaging. So our initial concept when we first began this project was a wavelength sensitive spectrometer with an LCD output to attach to an astronaut. As you can see up here, our first challenge was that we do not actually have the, the sensor that we need to detect the individual color wavelength spectrum. Now that was a bit of a shortcoming we've had, but we've been able to make do with the photoreceptors that we have, the photoresistors that we've had, and we're, well, we are using those as a proof of concept to show what we will be able to do once we have the, the appropriate technology implemented. Another challenge that we came across was the connected LCD display. The problem with this is that we were not able to uh, achieve a seamless transition between the, uh, the device and the base that NASA had required for. Another issue we came up with was our data interpretation and how uh, we were receiving the information from the device and how that was being decoded uh, by the logic system. Another challenge that ties into our packaging issue was the amount of time it took to develop, to develop the circuit board and the space uh, that kind of pushed back our, de our development process for the packaging. So here's the breakdown of how our device would work. We have incoming light that goes to the photo detector. And from the photo detector, it's sent to a microcontroller. Now this is an aspect that makes our product right here uh, unique right here, is that if the device uh, acknowledges that the, a lighting is too bright or too dim, it can indicate to the astronaut with a verbal buzz. 
and indicate the astronaut that they may or may not be experiencing light that could be harmful uh, to their health. So after the light uh, comes in, goes through the microcontroller, it is sent to the transmitter, where it is then wirelessly sent to the receiver. From the receiver, it is sent to the data central station, and then it is displayed in real time onto an LCD or onto a, a laptop or any Android device or really any any portable electronic device. So our initial concept for the package development. One key thing to realize here is that we need to measure the amount of light going into the eyes. So one key to take into consideration is that we needed the product to be located somewhere on the upper chest so that we can get the most accurate representation of what our eyes are seeing. So some consideration we thought of were, were headbands, eyeglasses, uh, magnet attachments. But in the end, those were not feasible because they did not provide uh, the wearability that we were looking for. So what we came up today with our prototype, as you can see up here, is, is a device that you can clip onto your body into an optimal location on the chest. And from that optimal location, you can receive uh, the most accurate light sensing. You can also access the hardware uh, through clip ports on the side. And as you can see, it's portable uh, and, and it's uh, wireless. So I'd like to remind you of some of our project requirements. The first requirement that NASA gave us today is, is our ability to log the light data. We needed to log the timestamp, the light intensity, and the light spectrum. Keep in mind that currently we are not able to log the light spectrum because we do not have the appropriate equipment. We are also required to have seamless communication between the central base station uh, and a receiver. And as you can see here, we have uh, been able to achieve that. And a stretch goal that we have set for ourselves is we also want to be able to make the device uh, work so that it can personally identify which lights need to be addressed because of uh, lighting issues. So with that being said, we're going we're to demonstrate our prototype here. So as you can see, this scenario is, is indicative of if an astronaut entered a compartment where the lighting was too bright, that it could be detrimental to their health. Now this is information that needs to be analyzed uh, to determine these thresholds. But as you can see, it gives a visual or it gives a verbal indication, as well as you can see up on the screen, the sharp up updraft is when uh, that light was received. So this gives NASA the light logging capabilities they are looking for. And we also took it one step further, making our product more unique by making it able to directly identify uh, either bright or low light situations. So for the future, where do we plan on going uh, from, from this prototype? Where do we, how do we plan on moving forward? The most important thing, uh, most important component we would like to do is we'd like to integrate NASA's data that they already collect on their astronauts, their sleep patterns, vitals, and we'd like to incorporate that, incorporate that into our, our central station so that we can provide an optimal, optimal way to monitor our astronauts' health. Additionally, we have made our product multifunctional, and we can apply this to a diverse market. Most importantly, however, we're going to make it this small. We're going to make it sizable, where it can fit and clip onto a, a jacket, a t-shirt, a pocket. And this buddy right here will be able to detect all the information the astronauts need. It will not be bulky, it will be small. You guys, you can pass it in. And we estimate these costs to be about $20. <clears throat> and all, lastly, most important, there is a diverse market outside of NASA, which we'll go through here. Here are some potential future market applications that we can do. Hospital care. There are 0.92 million hospital beds in the United States of America, many of which we could attach these into the rooms to monitor the lighting in the room to make sure that patients are receiving the amount of light they need. Workplace ergonomics. There are 20 million night shift workers who could benefit from knowing, who could, know, uh, who could be knowing uh, their circadian rhythms uh, and, and reduce the headaches and the drowsiness that goes along with being a night shift worker. And lastly, and most importantly, is uh, uh, something I think that could be a very strong a target market is commercial avi aviation. Last year, there were 160 million passengers in the United States who flew internationally that experienced jet lag. That is just coming in and out of the United States. We would like to think that we could uh, set this up into our into an aircraft and monitor the lighting in the aircraft and have it adjust the electrical system to provide the amount of light uh, that is indicative of their destination, so that they can reduce jet lag when they get there because their bodies have already been mentally. Uh, and almost subconsciously uh, have been addressed to the lighting of where they're going to go. <clears throat> so 
So we'd like to say special thanks to Texas A&M University, all the sponsors, the staff, the EIC, all the mentors, uh, and our peers who have helped us out. And uh, we'd also like to mention Andrew, uh, the medical student who uh, was on our team but is getting married, so we had to uh, go ahead and take care of those responsibilities. Uh, so this. Yes. Uh, my name is Austin Hahn. I'm a petroleum engineering student. I'm Sam Hubble, mechanical engineering senior. I'm Darren I'm getting covered in engineering. I'm Simon Wong. Uh, I'm second year student in computer uh, science. I'm Chance Perry. I'm a senior in electrical engineering major. Would you like to open this up to some questions? Do we have time? Okay. <coughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you have five minutes. Okay. So, why are you designing specialized hardware when your average smartphone has a camera that has enough, gives you enough data in order to implement this? Wouldn't it be easier yeah. to just write an app? The future uh, of this product um, that he mentioned earlier is that it not only um, estimates the intensity of the light, but it also measures the amount of light in uh, each color. So you're going to get a full spectrum, and you're going to know exactly how much light of red, blue, green, and anything in between you're getting. And so I think this is the most important thing for NASA. It's something that's so small it can do just that. Yeah, and, and to touch on that. So, so, and, and the most important thing is, you know, it's not just about the intensity you're getting, but the spectrum you're getting. The most important thing is how can you basically analyze the data and, you know, predict what hardware might be getting paid. Which is why I'm saying it seems like your software is important stuff rather than the hardware. I was just curious about what benefits you were getting from that. Well, part of it is that your cell phone's always in your pocket, so it doesn't see very much light, I think. But um, where would this data be streamed to if you're going to be streaming data from a small form factor? Uh, where will the data be streamed to? So, so if you're basically thinking of designing some application specific internet circuit that can send the data to the central base station, and they can just pop up there. So for like the consumer application, would that just be streamed to their smartphone? No, so, so for that kind of purpose, I, I think it would be a bit bigger. It can't be that small. Yes. So to develop the payload device, does it require developing a sensor that small, or does that sensor exist? No, the sensor needs to be small. The sensor will be small in that. And, uh, do you have to develop that sensor to be that small? You have to develop a new sensor that would be that small. Yes. There's not one that exists. No, no, we don't have to develop a new sensor that would be that small. We just have to uh, reconfigure our current we're hardware we're to be that design small. Design the small one, we basically integrate the small sensor onto an application that we integrate circuit, you know, to put the really small sensor. Actually, the sensor is very small. The it's sensor is very small. Uh, the current hardware we're provided, uh, if we were to make this product and to make it that small, uh, you can. Essentially, customize and specialize uh, you know, something that's small. Okay. The sensor itself is also small. What is that angel? Can we send someone yeah. that out? 500 feet. 500 feet. 500 feet. Yes. Can what we is? ask them to work with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the whole yeah. Can you do it right now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe. So there's the base I can go over there. Yeah, that, that micro store right there is. Uh, yes, it's another is the. Another part that we see the same on the screen. Yes, here, let me, uh, let me pull it up. Oh, okay, because I, I, I have two, two questions. So, the analysis, um, so this is very interesting. The analysis that you talked about doing where you can get feedback based upon the lighting, is that analysis something that's done at the base station? that there would be some communication back. Uh, okay. okay. Um, yes, actually, uh, quite a bit of research needs to go in, because um, as we're working through this project, we realize each person needs to have their own set of uh, ranges of colors that they need to take in. Uh, so on the bait, like on Earth, they're going to need to do a lot of training, a lot of research into, OK, I, my sleep patterns go down when I experience this and this blue light. And they're going to have to refine and adjust and adjust uh, this, the, the sensor to each person. Uh, and, and to touch on that, the <coughs> algorithm, uh, we would like to build it to be the, the central port there. And we'd also like to be able to uh, incorporate all the information that NASA already uh, has on their astronauts, the uh, sleep cycle, sleep monitoring, uh, vital signs. And we'd like to use that in combination uh, with the decline curves uh, 
to be able to indicate when uh, when astronauts are beginning to feel these effects, uh, and, and then eventually we'd like to be able to, uh, like we said, we'd like to determine which which hardware exactly is malfunctioning, and then fix that problem. And then it could be, the sensor could be something that's attached to something like a lanyard. So mm -hmm. it's not where it has to be a pocket or right, anything right, like right. that. For, for the NASA application, it needs to be uh, attached to the human body. Because the G4 failure, the, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, their Gs. Uh, and we chose the chest because any other location, you're not getting the accurate representation of your eyes. Because the key here is the light into your eyes. Is the mimic slide goes in your eyes, it affects your optic nerve. And from there, it determines, uh, as Andrew was going to go it determines the like, hormone. It affects your mood, your melatonin. It releases the melatonin in your brain and it affects your mood mostly. So that's why we are centralizing around the eyes and the upper area of uh, the body. Okay, well, thanks very Thank much. You guys. Thank you so much. All right, we've got the next group that's coming up. Uh, this is a uh, challenge that was given to us by Baylor Scott and White. It has to do with uh, pelvic floor muscles. I'll have the team uh, explain them. As they're setting up, though, I do want to acknowledge another person, and that's uh, Jim Wilson. Uh, I don't know if Jim's still in the background, but Jim, there he is in the very back. This facility is run by Jim. We are his guests at this facility, and Jim has done an outstanding job of supporting us throughout the entire time uh, with this entire weekend. He's had a couple of folks help him. Uh, Todd Williams, our machinist, as well as Chris Jones, uh, one of the one of the uh, technicians here who's helping us build circuit boards. So the support that we've had throughout this weekend by all of those individuals has simply been outstanding. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are the team that's produced this product called Under Control. My name is Nick Chalusen. I am a fourth-year aerospace engineering major. My name is Kara Busbiller. I'm a fourth-year medical student. My name is Izzy Lee. I'm a sophomore in chemical engineering student. My name is Walter Plastic. I'm a sophomore computer science student. I'm John Gondola as a junior mechanical engineer. All right, so how many of you have been ever in a movie theater or maybe uh, your favorite sports game where you're waiting in line and you feel that urge? Yeah, <laughs> that urge to pee. So then you have to make that decision of whether to hold it in or maybe you'll miss out on something when you leave. Some people don't get to make that choice. They have difficulties controlling their pelvic floor muscles, which will then control their urinary or fecal use. And with that, they come in all different shapes, sizes, ages. There's a wide variety of people that face this challenge of controlling their pelvic floor muscles, and they face challenges in their daily routine. So imagine living your life where you can't control when or where you relieve yourself. How would that change who you interact with, where you go, what you do? Now, so we're on the same page with what muscles we're talking about. I want you to all imagine that you're sitting in your bathroom on your throne, it's early in the morning, you're doing your business, and now you want to stop the flow. Bunch that muscle. Everyone feel that? That's the muscle we're talking about, that pelvic floor muscle. I'm going to tell you more about incontinence. Incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine and, and stool. Um, and it's not something we talk about every day, so it's a little bit uncomfortable. But come with me as I talk about this, because it affects a lot of people. It affects 60% of women, 2 to 8% of men, 1 out of 5 every 5-year-old. Um, it affects more than half of pregnant women. It affects many of the 800,000 people who have strokes every year. It's associated with chronic cough, diabetes, obesity, many common things, menopause, for instance, childbirth and pregnancy. Um, and it's on the rise, especially as our population begins to age. Um, the prevalence of urinary incontinence will increase with it. It's, a, it's projected to go to about 23% of the population by 2018. Um, fecal incontinence is also a problem. It's estimated by some reviews that it's 8 to 9% of people experience fecal incontinence. That's losing stool without wanting to, and it affects people's social lives, as you can imagine. Um, the, there's ways to treat this. Mild to moderate incontinence is usually treated first by physicians with Kegel exercises. As we did the exercise we just did to teach you about what on earth a pelvic floor muscle is, you did a Kegel maneuver, which is tensing your pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is, in this diagram, this muscular hammock which supports the organs at the base of your trunk. 
um, when you tense that muscle, you support those organs. People with poor pelvic floor tone often develop incontinence. So prescribing Kegel exercises is a good, cheap way to do things, but they're difficult to do correctly because who on earth knows what their pelvic floor is? So 30% of people can't Kegel correctly without biofeedback. Biofeedback is information about, yes, you're doing this right, no, you're not doing this right. And um, it's usually provided in an office or with an invasive device that you can use at home. For that reason, 44% of people in some reviews don't complete the biofeedback that they're recommended to do. So we were sent a needs statement by a, a urologist at Baylor Scott & White who said, give us something wearable. <coughs> give us something that will give patients biofeedback about correct Kegel technique with sensors over the abdomen and the buttocks, which are the, the muscles that are most used incorrectly to Kegel, and correctly to sense over the perineum, which would pick up the right idea for the patient. So some of our brainstorming ideas included some air pressure compression tubes, which would just measure the pressure differential of where the muscle is relaxed or tense. And it also included uh, flex sensors and, and conductive fabric. But we chose to stray away from this because we wanted minimal prep time and to remove any additional moisture in that region. And there was also stick-on electrodes, the traditional ones here, but we also wanted to emphasize on reusability and to just keep on using it without exposing anything. So our final um, product is the control. It consists of four sensors that are placed, that attach to the harness and placed accordingly to record the activity in each muscle group, that being the right glute, the left group, the lower abs, and the perineum. And all of these are attached to a central hub at, uh, connected to the left side of the harness for simple use of connected and <coughs> just to make it easy uh, for the user. Because some of our target audience might be uh, elderly and the less steps they have to take, the better. So some of, this is our diagram here. We have um, the different relays and then the different relays uh, open and close. So to the circuit so that we can record each muscle uh, one after another. And these are sent to an amplifier because by an actual muscle recording without it is very small and almost indetectable without it. So once we had that, it was connected to each one. And then all of these are connected to the microcontroller. And this uh, receives all the data and then displays it onto the screen to tell the user if it's the muscle is flexed or relaxed, and all this is conveniently placed in the box. So right now I'm going to talk a little bit about our actual design. So our actual design contains two parts, and they are both designed to be very user-friendly. Uh, user um, the first part is the garment part, as you can see, uh, where um, beads are made of straps, and uh, it's fabric, so it's very comfortable to wear compared to other material. Um, and um, uh, it, will, it was designed to be unisex. Um, they can be easily adjusted for, um, for, for both women and men. Um, and they can also be adjusted for people with different ages, body sizes. Um, and our centroid um, is placed right here um, because um, these are very stretchy. So our, um, our electrodes, sorry, our electrodes can be held against the skin very tightly. Um, and um, we, um, the beads are placed, located at the abs, um, and both right and left glutes and the um, perineum over, over there. Um, and um, we use wire instead of uh, electronic, electronics, so um, our material is totally waterproof and you can hand wash it. Um, and with that being said, um, our second part of the design um, is a handheld unit. So you connect this connector over there, and the user will be able to hold it. And um, we have a screen over here, and we have different openings for different uses, and um, we have switches. Um, users can, uh, will be able to switch modes, um, and those modes, uh, they were already coded inside the box. And um, on the screen, as you can see, is our actual 3D printing model. And um, the model is uh, more refined, and um, it's way more smaller. It's like um, 
the hand of, on the side of your hand, and it, it is very light. So the user will be able to um, use, use our model to hold it and read it very easily. A little bit about the software used. We use a very short, quick brute force approach with lots of if and else statements. Um, so as mentioned, we had a bunch of relays to transmit the data. So we had to uh, it's sequentially uh, switch the relays. In doing so, caused a bounce in the signal. So we had to manually debounce the data so that way we could get a accurate reading. And then so once the relays would switch, we would individually read each sensor for a couple seconds and then switch to the next sensor. And when that, uh, we, the sensors told us that the muscle is flexed, we display on screen that the muscle is flexed, and after that, it would maintain that. Also, there was a switch on the side that would allow us to um, the, choose a different mode. So the modes would be a very basic one teaching you which muscles you're flexing, and another one would be a little more advanced that teach you, okay, you need to be flexing a little bit harder than that. Um, and one challenge we faced was the we had to get a direct current from the muscle, which was a lot more challenging than we expected. Um, a future implementation would be using an iOS or Android device and making it a little more user friendly, and that would help with use in the pediatric, pediatric uh, regions. So a little bit through our design process of how we went about it is that first we needed to make sure we could receive these electrical signals from the muscles. And we were very successful with this, both through gel electrodes as well as these bipep ones, which we ultimately chose in our design. We were very successful in getting readings off of muscles from our biceps to the very small muscles within our face and the lower ones as well within this design. And there's very high sensitivity, so we saw the highs of the muscle being flexed very well, as well as the neutral state where you're not moving your muscles at all. And it created a dynamic range, so we could even see if the muscle was being held at a, a medium strength by the user. And so that would allow for further dynamic uh, instruction for the user to hold it at a high level, then a low level, then back to a middle level, and allow for a higher level of training to be used. And once we designed, or once we were comfortable using electrodes, we then went on to design the harness and create the electrical connections within the relays with the microcontroller, and the user interface comes in at the end. Um, so are we ready to, to release this to the public? Almost. Um, we're successful with the EMG. Um, as he uh, explained, we're successful with uh, dynamic um, um, work. And I'm really excited about this design because it's, it's uh, wearable, reinforcing a correct technique. It's easy to use at home. It's low pressure for the patient. Um, and it's also not exclusive to other devices. Internal devices are possible with our open design. Being a, with a physician, um, and in, uh, in uh, clinical biofeedback is possible with this design as well. Being in um, adult diapers is possible. Being um, it in many situations is also possible with our design. And so I'm really looking forward to the impact that this has for patients. I'm going into obstetrics and gynecology in less than a year, and I can't wait to use this. So I'm really happy that we were able to share this with you today. And um, we'll now open the floor to questions. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot um, just about what's next. Um, we'll create a completed prototype, hopefully replacing the wire with a conductive thread, connecting to smartphones, as already was stated. And um, next, we'll look for cost effectiveness clinically, and um, then move on to funner things like designing garments for different audiences and things like that. Um, thank you for your time and for your, for your attention. Thank you. Yes, sir. So this is um, one of his principal goals is for incontinent individuals. Yes, sir. So how does urine and sweat affect your dry sensor? Happily, um, urine and sweat, although they interrupt the sensor briefly, if once wiped away, do not affect any future reading. Did you tie this device? Sorry? Did you drive the actual device? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> we did try sensors on um, two of the areas of concern, but because of hygiene concerns, we did not attempt the, a full, complete test. We were waiting for something clinical for them. Individually, each, each area worked quite well, and we were able to get a solid signal through uh, each muscle group. But you tried it on some of your muscles. Yes, I mean, yes, yes we sir. We tried to match muscles that were of, of similar um, subcutaneous tissue depth and muscles that were of similar size so that we would have 
a reasonably accurate prediction of success. Um, so for your sensors, do you have to have direct skin contact, or would you be able to do it through clothing? We, we do need direct skin t contact for this. And, and part of one challenge that we um, look forward to meeting in the future is the challenge of, of hair um, and adipose tissue that will be posed by some of our um, some of the patients that will use this. Yes, all the way in the back. Um, is this device wearable by someone who has incontinence issues but is also still continent? Because you can, if they're urinating using a toilet and then they leave later, what happens to the device? Is it getting direct? I'm going to go back to the, and, and what effect does saline have it since urine is self-based? Self um, oh, that's something we um, had not directly thought about, the effect of um, crystallization salts on the, on the electrodes. Um, the elastic has no problem with um, solvents or solutes of any kind that we can look forward to, that we can foresee. But um, it goes between the legs. Yeah, it, it goes so between the... So female and using it is going to be getting it wet every time she... Well, it's, it's designed to pass in the inguinal creases, so it actually passes laterally to the labia majora, okay. so it shouldn't be a problem for urinating females. Yes? Okay. So how does uh, design how for the accuracy of the location, I think I'm not sure, like, let's say, good question, and in that case, uh, is this product to be customized for individual use, or well, um, so for your, for your first question, um, how is our sensitivity? Because we have not yet tested carefully in, in clinical settings, we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, for your second question, will this be customized? Um, it's customized as soon as the patient puts it on their body. It's in a different place for every person because every person is built differently. But as far as customization, I think that's a little beyond our ken right now for this 48-hour challenge. And also, I'm sure there will be a user book uh, built with it uh, uh, after it's like, unlocked uh, okay, and the user should be like, um, make sure to read the directions carefully before they use it, like, just like other products. We actually have a lot of uh, stuff ready, content ready for the user interface, mostly from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So my understanding is that you would only wear this harness when you need to do the exercise. Am I, is that correct? Correct. You don't wear it continuously. Well, it, it's up to the user because the exercises are often recommended in the first few weeks of teaching to be done three times a day for a set period of time. So it may be convenient for the user to keep it on all day and just do that three times a day when they're in the bathroom. Or they may hate it and want to take it off as soon as they're done. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. What, what is the process for approvals? I was thinking, will it make a difference if it is uh, attached to the body or with garbage in between? How much? What is the process for approving this device? For FDA approval? For FDA. I'm not sure. For this type of device, I do not know. <coughs> I look forward to finding that. OK, thank you all very much. Thank you. While the next team's getting set up, I just have, as you can tell, there's an awful lot of thank yous to go around. But we had student workers that were working throughout the day yesterday and actually stayed around all night. We had the facility open 24 hours a day starting yesterday morning, and our student workers helped us out by sticking around. And I want to acknowledge both Matt, who stayed here all night, Paloma, David, and uh, Ratika, who actually put together some of the things for us. So thank you very much for y'all being here. Whenever y'all are ready, take it off. Howdy. Howdy. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Nejim Beya from the Industrial Engineering Department. I'm Armin, Industrial Engineering Department. Uh, I'm Skorup, I'm from the Industrial Engineering Department. Uh, I'm, I'm from the Electrical Engineering Department. I'm Emre, I'm from the Electrical Engineering Department. <coughs> I'm Shayok, also Electrical. And our project is TAS. It's a Tactile Apnea Alert System. 
And uh, first of all, we'd like to take you into the environment that we uh, that this device will be used in. So uh, first of all, let's go to the let's go to the cath room. So the cath room is like a surgery room. Uh, it is usually used for minor surgeries, so it's like a dentist's office. So I'm sure most of you have had your wisdom teeth taken. So that's where usually you you take them. Now, uh, if we go in and we check out what the doctor would see, we see a lot of monitors going on. And the doctor, when he's operating on you or whatever uh, clinical surgery is doing, he has to acknowledge all these monitors. But our concern is uh, this particular monitor, which is a um, carbon dioxide tidal wave monitor, which measures, which tells you when a person has uh, affian and basically their best stuff. We'll, go, we'll be going more in detail um, in the presentation. So what Baylor, Scott, and White want us to do, they want us to create a tertiary alarm system that tells the doctor that a person's ha having apnea. And the reason for that is because there's a visual overload on the senses. So they, there's a cognitive overload. They cannot really realize what's happening. Uh, another thing, the device has to be tacked on. Uh, it has to be used by anesthesiologists excuse my pronunciation, or by the doctor himself. Um, and this device has to be wearable and not interfering with other devices. So um, I'll leave the floor now to Amin. First of all, we have to know what's acne. Acne is a lot of, it's when you can't breathe. But here we're interested in acne under sedation. Uh, if acne occurs and uh, first responders go to the, don't go to the patient, uh, there might be morbidity or morality uh, consequences for that. So we have to, our new statement states that we have to design a tactile, tactile device to, uh, to tell the doctor or, or anesthesiologist when an apnea occurs. What is tactile sensation? It's, it's basically touch, sense of touch, and uh, how we sense touch, it's uh, based on our skin, which is the largest organ on, in our body. <coughs> based on uh, multiple resource, resources theory, uh, we, have, uh, we, have an, uh, we have visual and auditory alarm, but uh, if we add a tertiary system, which is tactile, it might reduce, it, it's gonna reduce the uh, workload of, of the person operating and it's going to improve the multitasking of doctor and anesthesiologist. First, uh, we had to brainstorm what ideas uh, that we could use. We, we were uh, constrained to using a tactile, but tactile sensations have three types. Uh, the first one is texture, which needs a relative motion to sense the texture, and it, it needs several uh, devices to uh, induce the sense of uh, touching a texture. The, sec the second one was pressure, uh, which, which is going to induce pain, but the threshold for uh, sensing a pain is different for everybody, so it's not going to be useful for our project. The best one for us was vibration, which has been, uh, lots of studies has been done in this area, but there hasn't been a commercial product for vibration. Uh, so I'm going to take over the actual design that we actually went for. So here you can see uh, a 3D model of what we aimed at building, and uh, this is the actual prototype I'm wearing. Yeah, it's fully functional, and we actually got it to test under all conditions. And uh, I'll go over like the main components of it. So as you can see, uh, we have an armband, basically, uh, which has got four uh, vibrating motors, which are also called tactors. So these four motors are placed in contact with the skin on the under layer of the armband. Uh, so this basically forms the most important part. So every time uh, there is a signal of apnea or reduced breath rate, these motors are going to uh, indicate towards an alarm. And that's how you basically inform the doctor. We also integrated an LCD screen, uh, a button, and LED displays. Uh, these were mostly for a secondary use. Uh, we are actually targeting towards um, two main markets. The first one is going to be an anesthesiologist. So an anesthesiologist is basically involved in uh, really in bigger operations. And uh, 
this is a condition where you have multiple alarms and multiple type of vitals being measured. And um, so in such a scenario, if a person goes into apnea, we can imagine a lot of alarms being set up, which can be the heart rate monitor, the ECG, and it is very difficult to understand what alarm is related to what. And uh, it creates a sense of uh, sensory overload. So that's why we decided to use the tactile channel so that you give a personalized message to the doctor himself, uh, to the anesthesiologist himself, uh, who recognizes the signal and uh, can take necessary actions. Uh, but then uh, the basic signal that I think uh, we can uh, approach is uh, to, to doctors uh, who perform smaller surgeries, uh, basically in their own clinics. And so what we want to do is design a modular system which can go onto your arm, your legs, or even on your torso. And these will basically inform you of uh, if a person is going into apnea. So these are just alarm systems, so if a person is into apnea, his vibrator starts going on. And these vibrations are very similar to what we have on our phones. So it's not something that is going to be discomforting or causing any pain. Uh, so how we went about it is by placing four tractors. Uh, we placed them about 50 millimeters apart. And this basically gives the sensation of detecting each signal as a different signal. If they were any closer, if two tractors went off next to each other, we'd still notice them to be the same one. What we thought is special about our system is we're using different vibration patterns to depict different states, uh, which will be carried out in the next, next few slides. But then we thought of using a backlit LED display. Because every time an alarm goes up on your hand, the natural tendency is to see what's going on. So you would move your hand up. And the LCD display would actually display the patient's vitals on your hand itself. Moving on to the uh, different states that we defined. Well, uh, we define four different types of uh, rest uh, states. The first one, we um, define the normal state, which um, is breath like um, 8 to 16 breaths per minute, and then which will have a short part in one of uh, te uh, te 10 seconds, uh, every 10 seconds. And then the second one will be the reduced uh, breathing state which will generate um, four to eight breaths per minute, and then it will um, generate two um, vibrators, two at a time, and uh, it will buzz every 10 seconds. The next one will be the critical state. It will, um, it will breath, by, um, will be um, one to four breaths per minute, and the, it will give a pattern to um, vibrate each at a time. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you will last like um, you will repeat after 30 seconds, and then you will have a, a press um, fresh button to pause it. And then last last one will be the um, apnea state, um, which will um, repeat um, four of the um, actors together, and you will last 30 seconds. All right, so a brief overview of how the software on our Artmail board, uh, what it actually does, is essentially we thought the easiest way to program this was to set up a state diagram where each state is obviously represented by the press <clears throat> Um One of the challenges we had was actually sort of simulating uh, real life variations in breathing rates. Um, so we, keep, we don't actually have the input uh, from the CO2 monitoring device uh, to trigger our system. So we sort of try to come up with a way to um, simulate uh, normal breathing. So essentially, how it begins, um, you start normal breathing, and it tracks your uh, breathing rate and uh, puts you in a state according to what breathing rate you have. Um, each state triggers the vibrating sensors according to the patterns that we need to. So after, um, with the help of and Mr. Sinu, after we got the um, Arduino coded for to run a script that uh, generated a CO2 and tidal input, 
so that simulates it. Um, we have to set up the rest of the hardware system. So obviously, to do that, we have to um, integrate the four tactiles and tactile uh, fiber, fiber motors. And to do that, um, we use the two tactiles. But we use two couple transistors, and um, obviously, to make it wearable, we um, integrated it with a 9 volt battery to run everything. And then from that, uh, from the Arduino, we uh, tri simply triggered the tactiles at the specific instances in time and the patterns that were described by Juan. Um, so after that, so it obviously the tactile output goes to the arms. And once again, it will trigger and vibrate at the specific patterns dependent upon the uh, state you're in. So we have a short demonstration of how the system actually works. Um, here are our vibrators, and we didn't really want to include them in the in the sleeve here because it's a little bit difficult to hear and see the vibration um, from under the sleeve. So uh, the script running this will actually just take it directly through normal, reduced, and very low breathing and happiness state um, just from testing. <laughs> So we're in the normal state right now, and what you can't see is the LED is actually showing breath rate, um, which decreases, uh, which we're currently decreasing down to 14, um, which will continue down to 13. Eventually, we'll see a change in the state signified by um, a change in the pattern of the vibrators. Sorry, this became a while. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> apnea doesn't happen. Yeah. It's it's a are you going through apnea now? No. <laughs> <laughs> so how we decide to build the system was to have a, a continuous input and also an alarm-based system. So what happens here is the, base, the doctor is basically informed about a continuous alarm, giving him the current status of the patient. So in the first state, which is normal breathing, he's just getting a single buzz, which informs him Patient is all right, you don't need to worry about anything, it's just a regular buzz. Once the buzz uh, uh, red rate starts to decrease, uh, he reaches a slightly decreased mode where we have two buzzes going on. So apnea requires uh, acknowledgement from the so what we did was uh, the final two stages, which were the critical zone and the apnea state, required uh, an acknowledgement from the doctor. So this makes sure that uh, no signal is gone missed. And until the doctor acknowledges it, the buzzing is going to keep continuing. So this kind of builds a safety loop into the system. You've got 30 seconds to finish. Right. So we'll just skip to future work. Yeah. Um, so. We had a few uh, ideas about the future scope of this project. Uh, first thing, we could include not just uh, breathing rate, but other vital signs that are monitored in the hospital room. Um, we are always taking in data, so it may be wise to implement some prediction algorithms on those vitals to actually prevent the occurrence of um, apnea. And um, the other thing that we could do, um, once again, if you would like to customize it or if you're a nurse or an anesthesiologist, and you're not directly involved with the surgery, you could have a customizable touchscreen, you know, system around your arm, so you could have you could track the specific vitals that's pertinent to you or whatever you want to track. And also, the other thing is, you could have an interactive operation theater, basically, where um, if one person receives that, you know, apnea trigger, he can mess, pass it on, or multiple people could wear this device and they would receive. The triggers and they could pass it on to the doctor, tap him on the shoulder or something, and tell him that hey, we need to get this guy some more air. Okay, two questions. Um, an extremely uh, uh, extremely delicate task to supply uh, organ transplants or heart transplant or so. Uh, is the dexterity of the arm um, weakened at all on the operating doctor or is it? Will the vibration of the sensor actually interfere with their ability to control finite motor skills at really um, small minor levels? Um, well, that's actually why if you notice our wires are huge, <laughs> like it's wrong. Because for doctors, you can wear it wherever you want, really. You can put it on your legs or wherever. You're going to notice it some, somewhere. So that was the. And um, one thing I'd like to point out is in uh, a critical surgery like an organ transplant uh, or a 
hard transplant, uh, you always have an anesthesiologist on hand. And uh, the anesthesiologist is basically there to track the patient's vitals. And so by informing him, he's basically kept in. <coughs> So it seems like one of the challenges you identified was sensory overload. Yeah. So could you talk through the approach of why you chose to have a consistent uh, buzz? Yeah. Because it seems that that would also kind of be an additional sensory overload. Yeah. So um, so we know this is human factor, basically. And uh, so basically, multiple resource theory defines that um, we we all have five senses, as you know, and the most used are going to be vision and auditory. We also have smell, but it's the toughest one to control because to get smell, it's really difficult to decimate it again to get a new signal. And taste is something which differs from people and <coughs> also difficult to control. So tactile, on the other hand, is very easy to control through messages. So what multiple resource theory basically says is, if you divide your workload among these different, uh, among different resources that you have, uh, your multitasking performance increases, improves continuously. And to the second question that you asked, having a continuous alarm system. So uh, they had a lab uh, study uh, which basically studied the same pattern where uh, they had single alarm going off when only the person was in uh, critical condition. Or they had a continuous alarm. Or they had a hybrid system which basically integrated both similar to us. And multitasking performance was significantly better than all three performances. So they proved it in a lab. Okay, thank you very much. All right, if we could quickly switch teams. Uh, we're getting we're getting pressed for time. Um, we're gonna we're gonna continue on. So y'all keep moving, please. As soon as you set up, go. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to watch our team Neo Connect. How we're going to show you how we connect Neo natal infants to their mothers, and how important, and how quickly we want to connect them. Uh, my name is Dean Tate. I'm the doctor. I'm Jacob Moore. I'm Will Hall. Vincent Rodriguez. Jared Dyes. And we are the Missile Men, motivated in saving lives. <laughs> so today, and today, in hospitals, uh, one in every ten babies is born premature. Well, being born premature, you're going to have to be put into uh, some form of incubator that is going to monitor your critical life. And that's no life for a baby, especially when a mother has waited so long anxiously to hold her baby and now has to watch it in an incubator for 30 days or several months. And we don't, we don't want that. Nobody wants that. And so we want to encourage and have the technology to be able to take your baby home with you as soon as possible. When it gets to a stable state, we're going to be able to put it on a device that they're going to get to take home with them. And it's going to give them the professional monitoring of their baby that will tell them if they need to take it back to the doctor or how their baby's doing so that it, you can give more time um, the baby can be with the mothers so she can develop better. So how are we going to approach the problem? Texas Children's Hospital gave us a need statement and gave us some requirements of things they'd like to see implemented in our design. So of course monitoring the at-risk neonates, infants, and young children and monitoring these vitals is the utmost importance. But one of the key concepts and one of the cool things that we've been able to do is measure the vitals without attaching any equipment. So when a neonate or a premature baby is born, it's often very fragile. So any any sort of adhesion, anything that's grabbed onto them can actually injure them and maybe even tear the skin. So we want to avoid all that. We want them to be completely hands-free. We don't want anything on their body. And so once we get their vitals, we want to be able to transmit that data to a monitoring station so that either the doctor or the parent can monitor at the same time their baby's vitals. And we want to be able with the vitals knowing, say, if he has a high fever, diagnose that and address the appropriate person to contact. So we had several different product development mentors. Um, they showed us like the different types of um, 
um, like the different uh, vitals we needed to measure and to keep track of. And one of them was respiration. Um, we also had another product development mentor who has experienced this firsthand. And they said that, you know, the products on the market today are very not reliable. Like they end up taking them off and not using them and not using what they're for. So, so that brings us into our in initial design. Uh, it was based more off an uh, actual incubator, but we found that this was not feasible. It was too large, too bulky. It wasn't portable, and that's and quite frankly, no one wants to put their baby in a closed environment. So we had to ditch that idea and move on to some better ideas, which brought us into our second design, which was a foldable mat. We liked this a lot better because it could incorporate all of our sensors into a mat. It was foldable. Um, neonates have lots of stuff that need to be carried around with them, so putting that in the bag is a great thing for the parents. They're more likely to use it, and with the portability, you can transfer from the bed to the car seat to someone else's house, all at no additional cost, while still monitoring your baby and being able to monitor everything that you need, all their vitals, and then produce uh, the correct requirements. So that brings us to our final product, uh, the foldable portable missile mat. The three sensors that we have in it are a piezoelectric sensor for respiration detection, a thermometer or a th uh, temperature sensor uh, to measure the infant's temperature, and a pressure sensor to ensure that the baby is there. There are two similar to, uh, companies with products, uh, those to ours. Uh, Bedit is a company that makes a, a system that goes underneath your mattress, but it's more for adults and uh, it measures or it keeps track of your sleep cycle. The iBaby Guard does respiration as well, but it's not as sensitive for uh, what we need for the neonatals. So like Will said, um, we have a couple sensors and the way we integrated this is we have a piezo vibration sensor, which detects the respiration, the breaths. Um, we've got a temperature sensor that obviously is going to measure the temperature of the skin of the baby. Um, we've got a force sensitive sensor right here. Um, it, it detects and tells you if the baby is on the mat or not. And so to process all of this data, we have a Nisi Plus development board that was developed by engineering or uh, electronic systems. And what this does is it sends data over Bluetooth to a LabVIEW general user interface, as we'll show you later. And based on all of the signals that it processes, we have an alarm system in the form of LEDs and a buzzer. So implementation of the missile mat. We wanted to incorporate our three main sensors, the pressure sensor, the temperature sensor, and the piezoelectric sensor in the center of the mat where you're most likely to put your baby. And we wanted them in a small form factor area so that they could measure all their things in one area and not spread across. Um, getting this uh, measurements. And then the implementation of the, the piezo sensor, it's they require a very intricate and uh, delicate uh, filter system to record the data off of a respiration sensor. And so yesterday, our team actually fully designed and implemented our circuitry that was a, um, a four-band uh, low-pass filter with an operational amplifier to give our signal and to record the data. <coughs> like we said, all of this data will be transferred over Bluetooth to uh, a LabVIEW general user interface. And everything is going into our Nisi board, which has all kinds of inputs for sensors, different sensors that we can put on to this later on for more um, design. And it's collecting all the data from the sensors and transmitting it over to Bluetooth. So watch as our pre-recorded demo shows. Um, the top, we have temperature over time. The bottom, we have respirations over time. We also have a Celsius thermometer and a Fahrenheit thermometer. Um, and lights to indicate if the baby is present or if the temperature is critical. For us, the critical temperature range is above 35 degrees Celsius or below 27.5 degrees Celsius. So keep an eye on those two. So right now, we're simulating breaths right here. There's one. We're going to have a second, and then here in a second we'll have a third breath. 
So this is the baby uh, getting simulated breast. So now focus your attention to the top graph. We're going to make the temperature rise and go from the bottom threshold into the acceptable range, and then it's going to drop. And watch how the light responds to that. So um, a really bad thing that we get is false positives. So um, we don't want it to alarm as soon as it goes above or below the, the critical value. So this is getting a rolling average, and also we have a toggle over here to override the alarm system. Because if you have alarms going off throughout the day, throughout the night, parents become like desensitized to that. So if we had more time, we'd love to implement some more sensors in. So with our design, we have way the MISI board. So the MISI board has plenty more of extra analog and digital inputs for us to add plenty more sensors. So some more sensors we would add would be a CO2 or an O2 sensor that would actually monitor the air coming out of our baby to better accurately represent the respiratory system. Um, a microphone, which would add some baby monitoring functionality. Um, heart rate and blood flow, that will actually go with our PZO sensor. So how we did that was we looked at the frequency and we matched that up with the respiratory rate. But using the same thing, we can do that for heart rate and blood flow with just other sensors, with other air filters. So did we meet the review requirements? Do we monitor at-risk neonates, infants, and young children? We came up with a missile map and obviously accomplished that. Do we measure vitals without attaching any equipment? We used the piezo sensor and we didn't puncture or put any pads on the baby, so we accomplished that. Do we transmit data to monitoring stations? Yes, we did. We transmitted them over Bluetooth to a lab B system. Determining the severity of the diagnosis. Um, the doctors can log into the lab view system that we plan to eventually make into uh, in the cloud, and they can basically diagnose them remotely or not. So we did that as well. So the impact of this technology can go far-reaching. Our first market is for neonatal infants because you got highly calibrated sensors to detect them, and with one in every 10 babies born, that's a huge market. And we can help a lot of babies here. And also, to expand, we can also put these mats into every single um, bedding into hospitals all over the place. So no longer will you have to have sensors plugged in all over your arms and your fingers. You'll just have a mat that you can lay down on. So we believe that this technology could be very powerful for the future and helping. Thank you very much for listening to us, and we would like to take any questions right now. Um, I would also like to note that um, when everyone's done with their presentations, we will be happy to show you a live demonstration um, for the lab you do. Yeah. What's the response time on this? Um, that is, like, once um, a particular alarm goes off, how fast, in most cases, the parents then have to get the baby to the hospital. How far can they go with this thing to still be effective? You see, that, that's really dependent on diagnosis-specific data. Because it, say your baby has a temperature, um, but it's not a very high temperature. It's just a slight fever. Um, like from this, if it's really high, then if the doctor is logging in from the cloud watching it, um, they can see, OK, we need to get this baby to the hospital right now. Whereas if it's just um, irregular breathing or um, Something not as severe as like a high fever, you might be able to wait till Monday to take him to the pediatrician. So it's more of an alert to say, hey, you should call your doctor and yes. have to take him to the yeah. It's more to record the data, and then based upon that, um, what you would have to uh, input, um, you have to know what it's putting out, and then you have to make your own judgment. It's not to make the judgment for you in all cases, but it can do that based upon the what the data is. Perfect. You have made a very nice looking working system. In terms of innovation, what would you state as um, your key uh, uniqueness compared to what exists in the market? Is it just a market? Is it just a mat as opposed to your pets that you have already uh, seen in the market? If it is that, I mean, what would be the comfort level of putting the baby on to this mat as opposed to putting it in a bed that uh, a commercially available? Okay, the question is, what is innovation? What is the utility of your innovation? That's a great question, Mike. Um, you know, it's got all the sensors on it, so you're not connecting anything. 
So you're putting, you're placing your baby on here to take a nap, and then you can go off and um, work or however. Um, it's all going to be going into the cloud. Um, I guess the innovation would be you can take this. Um, these can be placed in the actual incubator. You can take them home. You can put them in the car on the way to your friend's house. If you go to the park and you want to lay the, the baby on the park bench, you can take it there and still be able to monitor the vitals and send it over the cloud to the doctor. If so you that's, want, that's our kind of key innovation. And if you want more innovate, another thing is that our sensor, our, uh, the sensor we're using to like find the heart rate, to find the hertz, and to find the frequency, that was a research paper that was given to us. That's not actual product. Like There's no product that actually uses that sensor and does what we're doing. So this is completely new. Now, there is a research paper that was done, but it's not a product. So this was a sensor that we designed, that we read a research paper, and figured out how to way to do this. Uh, uh, go ahead. Point to those right. uh, we'll, uh, we'll acknowledge that in the actual PowerPoint. But I'll let him address that again if you like. What's what the game point? Two-day work is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What's the How is your system different from what Bedit only has? Uh, well, from what I read of Bedit, it just monitors your sleep cycle. So, like, if an adult is moving around in their bed or something like that, it's uh, nowhere near sensitive enough for a uh, two-pound baby. Uh, like I believe it uses more movement. So like as you move in your bed, it's affecting your sleep cycle and telling you how well you're sleeping. So obviously if you're not moving and you're like a log, you probably sleep pretty good. And so I believe that's how it works. And one last question right here. That brings up the question of how does the baby's movement alter your respiration detection? Um, that would be a great question, but unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, we did not have a neonatal baby to test with. We tried, um, we tried, um, we tried, we, we tried simulating. Uh, it's just there's nothing like the real thing, so that would have to be done with more research. So we really couldn't address that situation and provide you with a good answer at this point in time. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. All right, next team. <laughs> Hi. 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 Uh, my name is Saul Kurshi, and I'm an aerospace engineering and a physics major. And I'll let the rest of the team introduce themselves. My name is Jaskir Batra, and I'm a PhD student in electrical engineering. I'm Yogesh Baba, I'm a PhD student in aerospace engineering. I'm Ryan Gates, I'm a uh, senior computer science major. I'm Saurabh Mishra, and I'm a senior computer engineering major. I'm Alaa Bashankar, and I'm a senior mechanical engineering major. Okay. So a fact that we recognize today, and the dinosaurs failed to recognize, <laughs> was that, is that Earth is a finite planet, the resources are finite. And we as humans are on a fast track for exploration of different planets and asteroids for resources or an alternate habitat. But the fact of the matter is the, the best propulsion technologies that we have today are extremely slow. So the astronauts are going to be in space for a really long, long time if you want to go to another planet. Examples being Mars. At best, we're eight months away from Mars. If you want to go another close by place that we know about is Titan. That's the Saturn's moon. It's over two years away from us. So we're putting astronauts at risk by putting them in space for an extended period of time. And this calls for innovation in medical technology so that we can monitor the health specifics of these astronauts. A good thing about these innovations is that they usually roll out into the market for general public use. Examples in the past being MRI and CAT scans that were developed for space missions. So particularly this time, NASA wanted us to take up one of their ECG scanning systems and be able to design a harness that can fit all the astronauts on, on a space mission for an extended period of time and monitor their vitals. What we went ahead and integrated in it was this harness could be integrated into different biomedical sensors that can detect a specific, uh, specific or a general, uh, general health condition on an astronaut. And to introduce the pro problem in detail, I'll let Jeff Skeeter take over. All right, thank you for the introduction. So as we go into the deep, uh, deep space missions that are long term, we require monitoring the ECG on the astronauts for a long extended period of time. Um, 
And the, the way NASA is doing that right now is, uh, which we'll also talk about later, but they have certain devices that can already do that, and they use this certain hardware that they provide us with, this device that basically takes signals from the electrodes and sends to this device that wirelessly then transmits it to either through a computer or another system. So what they wanted us to do was design a vest or a system that can be uh, that can fit to any size. So right now, something they're using is very specific to each user. So something that is user friendly, um, especially going into long uh, long term missions where the payload is a concern. So you need to design something that can be used by anyone and everyone and should be able to fit into what they already provide to us. So ours was not as much of an electronics project that other groups have done. Ours was designing something that can integrate with what they already have. All right, so the challenge, the key challenge for us was that, uh, so there's this so something called mason Licar 12 lead ECG configuration that is most commonly used for clinical practice in monitoring your ECG. So it monitors it at different locations. And these locations are very specific. So you need to put electrodes at these specific locations to know what's going on in your body. You're about to have a heart attack. You have a long term something going on uh, that could be dangerous. Um, but the issue is that as the body sizes for different astronauts change, that these electrode positions change where these need to be placed. So we have to design something that could easily adjust itself the electrode positions as different astronauts put them on. Now the concerns with the mason car configuration are that they require specific electrode placements. For example, near the shoulder bones, near the hip bones, that there are certain locations between the intercostal space of the ribs where these electrodes place. Now as body size varies, these locations change person to person, and hence the need was to have a one-size-fits-all vest. Now, NASA has been doing research with a number of different companies trying to come up with solutions for this sort of technique. And as you can see on the screens, we have approximately four to five designs that they're trying to come up with. The issues with each of these designs have certain issues with them. For example, most of these designs tend to work with electrodes that are fixed relative to themselves and not relative to the body size of the person. The other issue is discomfort issues. If you can look at image number one and image number four, these are extremely tight tend to tuck between through the groins. So when used, it, used for extended periods of time, this can get extremely uncomfortable. The other issues that they're working on is that the use of wet, wet electrodes. Now, wet electrodes are attached using some sort of adhesive. Now, these adhesives have an expired life, so they cannot send these adhesives up to space in bulk. So they require repeated consignments to be sent, and these are expensive. Hence, we had to come up with what was known as a dry electrode ECG. A dry electrode basically is the size of your coat button and it adheres directly to the skin without the use of any sort of solvent or lubricant. And that was what we tried to do. We tried to come up with a design that would enable us to use a dry electrode ECG, give us results that were comparable with a traditional wet ECG, allow these scientists in space, uh, scientists on, on NASA missions, to be able to put them on, take them off themselves <coughs> significantly easily, and be able to get these data out to either a, a physician on board or down to you know, Houston or any other ground control centers. So our solution was to use a variety of elastic and inelastic materials to create a shapeable framework for an astronaut to wear that they could custom tailor to their own body shape. The key points of this are the shoulder straps, which use an elastic back piece that allows the astronaut to reach over, bring it to the proper position, and then an inelastic strap to cement it, not cement it, affix it to their chest. This, in conjunction with a specialized series of straps that we made, for the uh, V3 through V6 electrodes on the side are relying on the user stretching it out and fixing it to a custom position that they determine will help them position on the ground to better position it for themselves, while at the same time allowing for advanced reusability and general comfort. So obvious features that we tried to incorporate in here, adaptability. We went through every single chest size we could find on our team, so ranging from the very small to me, the very large. <laughs> so the interchangeable components means that in the case of a unique body configuration or some sort of very specific instance, we could swap out components as needed. Uh, accurate placement. Now this is going to take a little practice for the accurate placement to be done, but our assumption is that once you do it a couple times, it becomes all hat and you're able to rapidly repeat the same placement of these straps for yourself while being able to share it with you and your astronaut buddies. 
cost effective. We estimate the material cost for this right now. If the first prototype is below fifty dollars, this may increase as we do testing on these other materials. But it's still significantly cheaper than the current setups that have been tested, put, gone, and off. Which means that with minimal assistance, you're able to put this on in under a minute. Mainly because of the fact that it's simple. The Donning procedure starts with you taking the underflap, affixing to a specific position in your chest, and basically wrapping around yourself like a back brace. It's comfortable, lightweight materials, and semi-breathable. So we were finally successfully able to integrate our vest with the processing unit provided to us by NASA. Using that unit, we were able to collect the data. And as you can see, we are able to see the heart rate and the various signals. The signals match the signals that are, uh, that are obtained from using a wet electrode system. And this was, uh, and the data was validated by a medical specialist, Chiara. And thank you for it. I'll provide the design summary. So in essence, we develop a flexible, adaptable, light, comfortable vest that can integrate with NASA's adapted Mason Licar configuration for providing for providing EKG slash PCG. Uh, you already pointed out the key features here. So it met and exceeded the expectations as given to us by our mentor. And its application, as we were developing it, we didn't see that just NASA could use it because now it's a dry system, which means that you don't need a physician to actually put electrodes on you. Some work will be done by the vest itself. But, the, but, but, but a nice addition to this, we thought, would actually be a system like that, although it's very simple. But think of a body-fitting vest, which has holes cut out instead of these pink patches which is to your size, you wear that on, so your body already has these markings of where the sensor should go. Now you put on this vest, and with already some intelligence built in, the sensors will be very close to where they should be. And then you basically use these straps and flap it up. And we've tested this process on the smallest of us with the 34 inch chest, and the largest of us, I won't reveal that, but <laughs> it can go up to, by design, it can go up to 50 inch chest with very slight uh, adjustment needed after the after the vest is put on. And that slight adjustment will be taken care of by an inner vest like that. So every astronaut could take just like a vest there and it will improve it. And in addition, we started thinking, it's a cheaper process, $50 thing. You don't need a physician. You could do it at home. This is a nice wearable health monitoring system. And recommendations for future work. I already explained you uh, the, the vest system. And we're currently working on a modified design for, for female astronauts or, or, or female patients who would like to wear it. But the design will be slightly different, but it can still be achieved. We've seen some pictures. So another one of the things we're trying to work with is better cable management on this. With that, we would like to give our acknowledgments to our mentor, Dr. Ray Navarro from GSC NASA, our, our medical helping student, and the mentors at EIC. Thank you very much. I do like one to say that that's our mentor in the middle, by the way. He's on the Aggie box. That's how we've been interacting with him. Okay, any questions? Do you have any questions? Oh, go ahead. Is the $50 cost that you estimated, is that just for the best, or does that include that electronics piece? Just for the best. Just for the best. Yes? Um, in what situations were astronauts wearing it? Would they be wearing it um, underneath their spacesuits, or would they just be wearing it? Um, while they're working like on the ISS or while they're doing deep space missions, when would they actually wear this vest? Currently, according to one of the, uh, the specifications that we received from our mentor, was that the test was to be con conducted in an immobile position. But we believe that since we've made it flexible, comfortable, it's fabric, felt, and cotton, that they should be able to f adapt it in the future for some something that you could put under a vest. So that you could use this and still be performing certain activities. For example, if you want to take a stress test, something like that, this should be able to take care of that. Any more questions? Any other questions? OK. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Dr. Lagos. The relation of the sensors, can you change them? You can change the position of these spines, but the relative placement of the sensors. Do you have any flexibility for that? Yeah, yes. the sensors are actually very symmetric, so they kind of look like just Port buttons, but they are special capacitive sensors. That's why they're dry electrodes. But they are symmetric. You can switch them out because 
they don't have any capability, any smartness built into them. It's the actual signal that you're getting from here that's being then sent to this device that processes it, all of it together, and then sends. That actually determines the actual ECG signal. Did that answer your question? You mentioned that there was a piece or a, another design that the relative uh, positioning of the sensors is important. Correct. So, so uh, this is what I didn't get in your product. Correct. How flexibility, how much flexibility? Absolutely. Now, in the center, the main idea is that the, there's a, there are electrodes named RA, which refers to right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. And there are sensors named V1 to V6, which refer to the positionings near the ribs. Now, V1 and V2 are ideally somewhere uh, between the fourth and the fifth ribs, somewhere here. And you have V5, V3, V4, V5, V6 coming around here. Now, with other devices, these are already fixed. So these are fixed into the strap. So V1 to V6 does not move. What we have developed is that we have a V1 and V2. Those positions, that's where you start placing. But V3 is on a strap that can be moved about. And V4, V5, and V6, since we, since we identified that they were supposed to be almost equidistant and in a straight line, we realized that we could put them on a single strap themselves, which can move about. This is a Velcro taping about here and at the back, so that you can you know, sort of lift them and move them around, depending on your body type and your body size, to ensure that they come in those perfect locations. So you, you talked about the sensors, and what about the device that has to collect the data? So does that have to be attached, or that's independent of the data? So the data is collected by this large white box right now, and since we had this available to so us, we had to integrate our vest into this design. Ideally, going further in your prototypes, what we would like to do is ensure that these wires are part of the harnesses themselves. So instead of having this spaghetti strap kind of you know, system which might get, which might interfere with other mechanical devices or instruments. They'd be a part of the vest themselves. So you'd simply have all the wires coming and collecting to a small box, which would transmit it, you know, to uh, an Android phone or you know the station on the on the spaceship itself or on the ground. It is a Bluetooth enabled. It device. is a Bluetooth enabled, but it's just a little bulky. But that was given to us. Our our goal was to make a modular adaptable uh, vest that can adapt to sizes. And a small astronaut, big astronaut can vary to the minimal adjustment. And we have very well achieved that. OK, thank you very much. So, <laughs> One of the things that they didn't have time to design is, is that those straps over here to the left is actually modular. And they were designated such that by an astronaut design, and then also they pulled the straps up to actually wind up placing them. So it's a uh, uh, the NASA person, as they said, who was participating by our Aggie bot. I was very impressed with that particular design. So continue on. Oh yeah, yeah. We got to return these sensors to NASA. <laughs> Howdy. Howdy. Our team name is Lite. My name is Mara. This is Jonathan. This is Taj. Um, this is I'm Shelby. Shelby. <laughs> and this is Yen. And um, we have developed a system for monitoring neonatal infants. It's wireless and um, it's very mobile. So basically, the main problem that we're facing, let me just tell you a little bit about it. It. So 7% of babies have to go into neonative intensive care units, and that is about 277,000 infants we're talking about. Now, when they're taken into these units, they're attached to many sensors and wires, and that becomes such a hassle when you're trying to change diapers, things like that, move the baby around from one place to another. You have to carry all these wires with you. Um, another problem with this device is that you have to um, stick adhesive less to the baby itself, and because the skin is so sensitive at that age, when you pull it off, it ends up ripping off skin with that, which is very bad for the baby. 
another problem with this is um, once the baby is at a stable state, it can be taken home, which is ideal for any parent. But you have to bring all this monitoring equipment with you. And then um, you're constantly monitoring the baby with these devices, but there's a high chance for false alarms because any slight change in the baby's vitals will make an alarm sound to the machine, and the parent will have to wake up, usually in the middle of the night. They're already sleep deprived. So within the first 72 hours, most of these parents just unplug the machine entirely because of the stress and the hassle of it, and that is a big risk for the infants because now they're not getting into any monitoring at all. But we have developed a system that has no wires. Um, it's a beanie for the baby, so we call it the baby beanie. And basically it has a temperature sensor, it has pulse sensors, and it has the O2 level in the blood. Um, and it's constantly monitoring those systems. It transmits that information wirelessly to a cell phone and also to the hospitals. And um, now, Shelby's going to tell you a little bit more. Okay, so our sponsor was Texas Children's Hospital, and what they told us to, or they asked us very nicely, to do <laughs> was to design a system, a monitoring system, to collect and monitor and transmit this vital sign data to a, well, they didn't specify, so we came up with that. Um, we were supposed to organize and present it on a nice uh, user-friendly interface so that we could eventually have this be used in the home of these neonatal uh, children. Uh, like Moore said, we need minimal contact, so no adhesive. We don't want to hurt the baby. We want just, as we want the baby to grow up very nice and strong. Okay, so our design inputs that we put in when we started to come up with a solution. We wanted to monitor the heart rate, the respiratory status, like uh, with the pulse oximeter, respiratory rate, we'll show you how, which one we went with, and temperature. We want it to be easy to use, and we wanted to increase customer compliance because, you know, unplugging the monitor system is not going to tell you what's going on with your child at any given time. We wanted to minimize these false positives with uh, algorithms, and we wanted it to be wireless, and we wanted the information to be sent to like a cloud storage so that the physician can access it while the child is at home. And we also wanted that to be, uh, we want to send it to an interface such as a smartphone so that the parent can also monitor it, and it will tell you when the child needs to be taken to the hospital. Yeah, and our unusual design is actually implanting the sensor into the matrix. But we encounter some problem in the sense that there is very low sensitivity, a loss of noise. Also, it's very difficult to accurately position your baby. Every time you change diaper, you will have to put them back at exact position. That would be very difficult. So to increase the sensitivity and the position problem, we, we decided to use the diaper build. And we know that we are supposed to be minimal context, but since a, a baby in the ICU and the baby at home, they all have to wear diaper. So if we have a sensor underneath a diaper and just use the pressure exerted by the diaper to hold the sensor in place, then we technically do not exert extra contacts. However, we encounter a problem with hygiene. As you know, the baby has a watery waste, and that every time they have um, watery waste, we might have to clean the sensor, the bill, and it will just create extra hassle to the parents. <coughs> so we move on to the chest bill, which it create extra contacts in exchange of hygiene issues. <coughs> so we later on think it's not ideal for the what the hospital want. So later on we um, change to the Benny hack. In this design we incorporate the sensor within the hat. Uh, to make sure the oxygen saturation level, the temperature, and the pulse rate. The, the pressure, uh, we, we hold the sensor by the pressure of a bunny. And most of, since most of the baby at home will wear a bunny to preserve the heat, so we don't really create any extra unnecessary contact. And since we don't have exposed wire, all the wire will be within the hat. Uh, we reduce the chance to accidentally sprinkle your baby and, as, and reduce the chance to accidentally unplug the sensor. And 
right now we are wirelessly transmitted data, and in, ideally we want to move all the computing power to the cloud. We we hope to use uh, the um, large computing power of the cloud to reduce the false positive rate. That is typical thing in the currently commercial product. Talking about the prototype, the first thing I want to point out is that this does not look like a scary medical device. We did that on purpose because, as you know, parents with neonatal infants are going to be making several trips to the doctor's office every week, every couple of days, and so they do not need another reminder of the child's health condition. They want to resume, resume a sense of normalcy in their lives, and we hope that by doing a beanie factor that is not scary looking will help provide that. This includes currently two sensors. We have the pulse sensor here, which will be located on the temple, and you can also tell that the beanie has a nice form factor, so it's you have to put it on facing the correct direction, which will aid in the user having that sensor lined up. Also hidden within it is a temperature sensor to measure the infant's body temperature. And we'll actually go through a live demonstration <laughs> with that. <laughs> so with there's the a sensor. So yeah. the interface isn't the best, but it does successfully transfer <laughs> the data. So for the beats per minute, uh, we'll, let it, we'll, let it, we'll let the cloud get some data first. Let it level, level out. And then and the same beats per minute 78 right now. His heart is beating really fast. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you must be nervous. I'm nervous. You must be nervous. <laughs> Just in, in just no, let you know, I'm not volunteer doing this. <laughs> but the baby cannot put it on though. Can someone else? Yeah, somebody can put me on. But yeah, mm -hmm. Dad, if you want mind. to. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did a really good job. Yeah. And so basically, I like, want to like there's a center. You kind of can see, and you will want to align in the center, and then yeah. you will I like put the the sensor in the correct position. Yes, because it does have the pulse sensors, which will be on the baby's temples. It says the temperature is negative 23, but it needs to be, it needs to be 23. But we just did not get time to fix that. <laughs> What's a minus sign? Yeah, yeah what is a minus sign? <laughs> <laughs> this was also built on a source for the So uh, we believe we, we reached our target goals by minimizing the contact of the sensors and the baby. And uh, also, uh, also we believe that getting the cloud data uh, in the future, we can increase the processing and get better, uh, get better data and less false positives. Also, uh, in the future, we can broaden our market uh, into adults and also er the elderly. We can put these on uh, pretty much any, everyone has a head who's alive. Anyone can use it. And also, uh, if it's in cold weather, you, you can use it in cold weather if you're going on a jog to, because I, I know a lot of adults now these days want heart heart rate monitors when they're running. So this is a perfect, perfect way to use it. OK, we just wanted to take a quick second to thank all of the doctors for all of your input as you know stakeholders. It was really helpful. All of our peers, you guys really helped us too, and all the faculty and mentors. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, any questions? Would you do the acknowledgement? That not in Yeah. I know, but I, 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 wish, I wish I could find your uh, full name, but I just, <laughs> Thank you. all your teammates say, so I said, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I question, how much hardware is actually inside that hat? Is it simply electrodes, or could that hat actually be like a stocking knit? Could the electrodes be attached to the stocking knit hat that all babies get that's part of their, uh, at, at birth? That is exactly why we why we made the cap is because it, it, instead of using the, the stocking, we can just use the cap instead. Okay, the so, there, so all that's in there are is those electrodes. Electrodes, There's and there, no there is a processor inside there, yeah. but uh, we, we can minimize the size uh, with a better okay. hardware. Yeah. So ideally, it would be smaller, so fit in those hats. And my mother in law was knitting the beanie for her granddaughter. She used the size of an orange to make the size of that beanie. 
can you make it that small? Yes, sir. Like I said, hopefully with the way technology is advancing, we'll have microprocessors that could be made that small. Like I said, the research we've done so far is a little inconclusive, but I do have high hopes for it. If not, we could still possibly use near-field communication or other sources to provide that data and power to the sensors and extract the data that way. Tower, the, source, uh, the, the sensors are really small, yeah. and the, actually the, the pulse sensor is uh, pretty large, which will give us a better reading for the, uh, for the neonatal. How big is the processor? Right now, it's pretty much right now it's pretty <laughs> 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 We would have liked that. And hopefully, we can just like transfer all the computing power to the cloud. So, but one thing to remember with the processor size that she showed you mm -hmm. is that's also on a shield for prototype. <laughs> when we actually can do you know surface mount electronics and come up with the fine lines design, it will be a whole whole lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, children don't always do it like we'd like them to. They don't always leave the little beanies on. So do you have a way to evaluate whether the bean is going to be on regularly and then alert the parent to put the beanie back on? Well, I guess right now our target is the newborn. So I don't think they can consciously do this. And they, cannot, and they also don't move this. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, were trying, we talked with the customer and, uh, 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 and they said that, uh, actually, uh, Doctor, uh, sorry, can you remember? Uh, he said that uh, he had, had neonatal babies, and he said that once you snug them in tightly, they just don't move. They just don't move that much. So that's perfect for uh, for, sen uh, for putting sensors uh, on staff. I should send mine over to John then. <laughs> <laughs> but also, once, once the hat's off, you start getting no readings, and so maybe that would be a sign that, right. oh, the hat fell off. Let me go. Move or back. something has dropped. No, that's when you need the missile man. <laughs> so the two are collaboration. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would be great. You could collaborate with them. <laughs> yeah, we actually uh, had thought about using a cap and also the mattress, but it was just too much integration going on <coughs> at that point. And also, we hope to make the product into one piece, so two separate pieces. Okay. One more question. There is one. Okay, then, thank you very much. <laughs> we have a, uh, one last presentation. Um, so we've been saving one of the best, one of the best for the last, right, guys? Okay, here we go. Somebody that knows this, did we do something uh, for the PowerPoint on the screen? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, everything seems to be here. Pull it out and put it back in. We are Introspectrum, and I'm Colton Wiley, Senior Ocean Engineering student. My name is Brian Musselwhite. I'm a master's student in aerospace engineering. My name is Benjamin Ross, a mechanical engineering student, senior. Zachary McElvoy, junior industrial engineering. My name is Sean Archer, and I'm a junior chemical engineering major. Derek Ladd, electrical systems engineering technology. And this weekend, we decided to tackle NASA's deep, uh, deep space lighting problem. So as technology progresses, mankind will travel, travel deeper and deeper into space. And with, and with this, some problems arise, such as uh, hardware degradation over time. And what that includes lighting system degradation, which is where our problem arises. We were asked to create a wearable light sensor that can monitor light intensity and light spectrum, can then programmably log that data every, and then transfer it every 5 to 30 minutes in 5 minute intervals, and then send it to a data, to a data station. 
So this is a really important technology for two reasons. First, our our uh, our sensor would be would literally be able to sense the light, analyze it, and then let you know whether you need to change that lighting system or not due to the level the level of uh, degradation that has uh, that has happened. And then, secondly, and most importantly, are the health benefits that a lot of you probably know about physically and mentally, and especially for astronauts who are in space for very long amounts of time. And this is typically one of the biggest, there's multiple factors, I mean your skin's involved, but one of the biggest factors we found is that light through the retina um, interacting with the hypothalamus, which then regulates melatonin production, which is very influential in your sleep patterns. And like all of us, if our sleep patterns are interrupted, we sometimes become quite grumpy. Yeah, so as we begin to think about this problem, uh, we have a lot of different design elements to think of. Um, the biggest one being that we needed a consistent light rating. Um, we needed to have it somewhere on the body that wouldn't be blocked. So we considered things such as hats, shirts, headbands. Um, so everything from style uh, considerations to the headband to the opposite end of the spectrum of potentially integrating into um, a modern smartwatch. Um, we consider the whole spectrum there, um, but decided that all of those things potentially have the ability to have an interruption of the light source. So we ended up on a design that would incorporate multiple light sensors and would have the ability to clip anywhere, whether that be the back of your sleeve, on top of your ball cap, on the sleeve of your shirt, in your pocket, giving you the ability to put that somewhere that will be sure to give you um, a consistent light reading. And this is sort of what our prototype looks like. We started by um, prototyping sort of the general sensor layout, um, which was going to be a big factor for us in being able to tell the difference between spectrums. And so we had to custom build a light sensor using a series of filters to be able to tell the difference between uh, simple intensity of light and different colors of light. So we started out with a prototype like this that allowed our team to get on the same page, and also then to present that to our mentor in our first conference call and get his feedback, which was all positive, on um, the spectrum we were analyzing and the data that they were hoping to get back from it. In preparing for this, we also did some things um, like we're able to use this brainwave monitor to um, confirm for ourselves some basic findings on how lighting can affect mood, um, and also to take some spectrometer samples using some online webcam-based tools to get an idea of the spectrum we were dealing with um, and what bands we could easily detect. And y'all can see here that we decided uh, we liked the clip-on uh, design, and you can see we have something similar to our prototype. We have multiple colored lenses. Uh, we chose violet, orange, and green. Those were three different colors that allowed us to uh, find variances between different colored lights. And we also have a clear one for just measuring light intensity. Um, with this, we had a simple clip-on design. We integrated in uh, an Arduino Uno microcontroller, which allows us to take in uh, four analog inputs. And then through a uh, microcontroller, we are through a microcontroller talking to a wireless card. We're able to send this wireless card to this hub, and through this hub, we're actually able to communicate to this device. Uh, but I'd like to pass this on to Sayed to talk about the construction. All right. So in order to create like a like a safe, reliable, and a good-looking prototype, we had to uh, we had to create a case for uh, for the microprocessor and the sensor itself, uh, but. For for uh, for us to achieve that, we had to uh, we had to uh, uh, dimension dimension it consistently because uh, if the numbers weren't right, then this thing wouldn't fit. So for that purposes, we used the 3D printer technology that we were uh, provided by uh, by Texas A&M, and we uh, I guess use the uh, use it to our benefit, and we uh, use to create the cases for the microprocessors and the sensors. And so part of part of this uh, challenge is we were supposed to design well we did design something that could uh, then transmit this data wirelessly. So we're collecting all this data about light and you know what do you do with it? So our solution uh, we actually ran uh, another Arduino with a MATLAB program where we could actually import the data, analyze it, and then do whatever you want to from there. If you want to you know, go in and adjust lights. If you want to report that a certain light is out, maybe there's, uh, you know, a certain tone that you've had too much in a day. Maybe that's causing some agitation that uh, you're, you might not be aware of. 
all of this can be done through MATLAB, which is really nice. So. Yeah, so we're going to give you uh, a bit of a demonstration here. Um, right now, the functionality that we're going to demonstrate is uh, this is ability to uh, notice um, a change in light and adjust uh, these lights accordingly. So uh, if you'll notice, as it gets dark, those lights uh, dim, um, dimmer than they were before. That's about as, about as dim as they're going to go. I don't know if that was completely unrelated. <laughs> um, as, it, as it lights up, you'll notice that it's going it's to recognize the light and adjust the lights accordingly uh, based on the ambient good light. So we can adjust based on intensity, um, and in the future, um, continue to adjust the tone of each individual light um, to actually adjust for the degradation of light. So if I can give a quick, quick example, um, you might see that um, a typical light would start over in the white um, or blue spectrum in the typical LED. And during degradation, you'll start to see a fade um, in the color as it starts to get warmer and potentially even get into hues that begin to be harmful. What this allows us to do is using the sensor that each astronaut will be wearing, notice this degradation, and without having to immediately replace the entire system, simply adjust the LED values back to the other side of the spectrum and provide more of a pleasing tone um, in allowing those astronauts to um, sync with their circadian rhythms. And also, the continuation and the entrepreneurial um, extension of what we have here in being able to um, apply this simply to the blue-collar worker who works a night shift, um, and even as far as just commercial applications in everything from a dance hall, banquet halls, um, to allow easy customization for events uh, and things like that. You can easily place these throughout any building in a, a typical light socket. Okay. And uh, this design was initially for NASA. So next we have to verify that these will work in space. Um, one issue is as we are starting to uh, leave the, the planet, we're getting farther and farther. We're actually leaving the Earth's geomagnetosphere. So in the International Space Station, they're actually in low Earth orbit, and they actually have a lot of protection. So as we leave, we need to make sure that this prototype or the, uh, future device will not be harmed by the radiation. That's also could damage the lights. Yeah, so as we continue to develop the prototype, um, our big concerns will be simply ensuring that the miniaturization doesn't hurt the product um, and its capabilities. Oh, yes. Currently, we're using an uh, open so source Arduino. This is a microcontroller that, uh, that is great for prototyping, but it's really bulky. With integrated circuits, we can design a board that's much smaller. And I'm a Star Trek fan. I would love to have a little of that. Uh, so, um, and, uh, but we'd like to say thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank all our sponsors. And uh, thank you all for listening and, uh, and listening to our presentation. And that will be Good time for a couple of questions. Yeah. How are the lights changing? Do you have an IC for each light bulb that's changing? So the colors change, or is that something you can like plug into a whole factory and adjust the whole factory's light? So these bulbs are uh, the bulbs themselves are a commercially available product um, that work over a Wi-Fi signal, um, and so we were able to plug into the API for that and um, integrate that all the way from uh, the light end of things all the way through both of our Arduinos, um, the wireless code that we wrote all the way back to the um, sensor to integrate that with. Um, to make it smart instead of um, requiring direct user control. But these use a uh, variety of colored LEDs uh, coupled with pulse width modulation to control intensities to go from one spectrum to the other. In the International Space Station, they have all LED lighting. Um, and we're hoping that they can have multiple colors. They'll have some red hues, some blue hues. So once the lighting degrades, we can actually adjust it and maintain an optimal level. How do you identify which lights need to be adjusted? Glad you asked. There's uh, the four different filters on it actually will give you different intensities. And if you, we talked with the Dr. Electronicist, that's not his name. But, uh, he's technically not exactly the spectrum you're getting, it's the hue, which they are related. 
and it might be changed with the degradation and radiation, you could calibrate it still. But with the uh, algorithm and taking the percent differences between the intakes and the light intensities, we have one that doesn't have any filter on it, so you take that intensity and there's a lot of a lot of math, not enough time to like get it right now, but you can tell differences that are you're able to right, relative differences between the right. different um, sensors. And so, we were able so to building like, on that, why wouldn't you uh, do kind of like something we talked about where you get a single sensor that can uh, take in those multiple wavelengths? Sure. So, you guys sure. So I mean, obviously that would be the optimal solution, and probably something that would be integrated into a, a small future form factor. Um, this was something that we did to allow us to have a fully functional prototype um, with the materials that we all were able to bring in. That would be a full spectrometer, which they're expensive, they're big. It's kind of it's walking the, the size line. For yeah. Your... yeah. How much uh, would it cost for you to implement this uh, system? In a greenhouse. In a greenhouse? With people inside. So it would depend. The big cost would be on whether there's already LED lighting. Uh, if there's a LED lighting system in place, um, the cost is um, significantly less. And you could hook up um, a system like this into the current LED system and just simply be able to control um, your LEDs. If you already had the LEDs, $30. Yeah. Can you make recommendations like how to the shade should be implemented? Or how the what should be implemented? Like shading techniques and how yeah. the Absolutely. diffusion of outside light with the field. Right? Sure. So that would be the benefit of having multiple um, people or locations with these sensors, is you can compare those different um, values and um, run simple experiments with them. You can put these things on timers. Um, to see the difference and the exact change in intensities and hues that would um, be able to you know, have constructive or destructive interference. And using a spectrometer, we could measure the light. If, if this was in a greenhouse up in uh, somewhere in the northern hemisphere, uh, we could measure the light. In college station. I mean, in college station, yeah. So we could measure the light. We could see how much light. And then you could actually supplement it if, we have, if we're in the winter and we're trying to grow uh, year round. We could supplement light and maybe produce a more optimum uh, light band for what plants absorb. And that would go back to sort of the circadian rhythm of the plant. If you decided that you wanted to have a, a constant light level, you could easily adjust that um, to change based on how much um, outside light you're getting. Or if you wanted to have that on a timer to slowly uh, dim out, dim in, um, things like that to create um, day-night rhythms. OK, thanks very much. Thanks. First of all, I'd like to give all of the teams a, a tremendous congratulations. Y'all have done a tremendous job. I, I, I do not envy the judges' next task. Uh, Y'all have a tremendous task to do. And if you don't mind, uh, we're going to give you all a little bit of a consulting room. So if you'll follow Diane tonight right back there. We'll ask you uh, to go away and, and decide on your selection process of the first and second team. And Diane will lead you there. And we'll meet right now. It's 520. And for the rest of the folks, if y'all would just stay here for just a second, I'm going to give you a few more instructions. And then we're going to meet back here in 20 minutes uh, for the award ceremony. All right. So I have a few last things that I'd like y'all to do. First of all, all of you who have participated in this Ag inaugural Aggies event, y'all have been outstanding. I mean, the attitudes, the cooperation, how you helped each other out. You jumped in and helped each other out when they had problems. It has simply been outstanding. I could not have asked for a better group to get this thing started. So y'all did a fabulous job. And it was, it was, in my opinion, very successful because of your attitude, what you brought, the knowledge you brought, and, and the skills that you brought to here. So congratulations to every one of you, because you all did an outstanding job. Now we need your help. Now I need your help. Okay? Many hands make light work. 
Jim has graciously allowed us to use the lab and so here. So we need to help clean up. All right. So I'm going to ask you all to help clean up. Take all your sense. First of all, all the prototypes. I would like all the prototypes, unless you had brought in your own laboratory equipment, I'd like all the prototypes to be left up here, please. What we'll do, don't disassemble them unless you have to return the material, because we'll disassemble them for you, but we want all the prototypes left up here. So we'll take some pictures of them and continue to uh, use them. So please leave them up here. Any sensors and that you didn't use, put back on the table. We'll sort those out. Don't worry about sorting them out. Put all the sensors you didn't use and all the material you didn't use back on the table over there. Please return all the equipment you checked out into the equipment room. Please return it all out there. Um, we have a, uh, we have, uh, Ratika in the back has certificates for every one of you. So all of you have certificates. If you'll see her, she has certificates for each one of you. And then um, we have a survey for you. It's been emailed to each one of you. Please fill out the survey. Please, please fill out the survey. We want to make this another great event. We want to continue to offer these. But the survey is the only way that we'll be able to know how to make this better. All right, so please clean up. Take the food with you that's in the, uh, that's in the break room that wasn't consumed. And we'll meet back here at uh, 540. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>
congratulate all of the student participants for a phenomenal job. So congratulations. And all of the judges, we had such a hard time uh, picking out third place that what we're going to do, and this is thanks to the support of the system and TEAS and the college, we're going to award six um, third place recipients. <laughs> and so each third place team will receive $100 to say right. thank you for the phenomenal job because you did an excellent job. First, let me just say that uh, it was a, a spectacular weekend uh, for me personally. I had a, a, a blast uh, working with all of you. Uh, congratulations across the board. I'll reinforce the, the difficulty that uh, the judges had. Uh, and I'll tell you, for me, I had a, a from high to low, a 10-point spread amongst you all. So it's really uh, very tight. Great job, everybody. Uh, this was, this was a, a, a real treat to, uh, to be part of. So second place uh, with a check of uh, a big check of five hundred dollars goes to Good Baby. So, uh, so for those of you who don't write checks anymore, <laughs> since this was not initial, I'm not sure that that's, that's real. So. It already says not <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Okay, and then for the top prize winner, Dr. Lagutis and Dr. Anand. Let's invite Dr. Anand. We'll call it together. <laughs> <laughs> The winner is the team under control. Again, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. Um, Y'all put in a tremendous amount of effort, a tremendous amount of activity. Please, again, help us clean up and finish this out, um, as I know that you will, because um, Aggie Spirit is just one of those things that is a unique commodity. And please help us finish cleaning up and get this thing set up for uh, the, uh, business tomorrow. Um, what we will do is, uh, now that I have all of your UINs, we'll place this money in your account, so that you'll see it over the next couple of days. Um, I am astounded by the generosity of the system and the, the rest of the uh, judges, so thank you very much for your continued support. Um, any quick feedback from anybody here? 30 seconds, anything. Thanks for the food. It was great. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can do this around all you spam. Okay. Martha and Diane and Rodney to say a round of applause yeah. because you all have put in so much time with um, the planning that went in. So, uh, here are what a team! Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's have Dr. Alan close this and say a few things on behalf of Dr. Banks also. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say? <clears throat>
and send send our students to go back to their normal lives. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so don't forget to fill out the survey. Yeah. Right, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out. If not, I'm gonna hunt you down. <laughs> All I want to say is that on behalf of uh, Vice Chancellor and Dean Banks, uh, congratulations and thank you. This is all we are about. Okay, we have uh, we have been thinking whether to do this every weekend, maybe no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Please clean up when you're finished. Have a great rest of the evening. Oh, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you so much for working on this. Oh, I mean, I have been like always being like everybody's kind of like Thank you so much. Have a great night. I love this space that Matt was like. So unfortunately, um, the engineering faculty oh, well, is start until next year. Um, so I'm going to try and meet with you know, so, so, like, like, so, 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 so we are thinking about the next one. So we'll be back. Yeah, that's not good. If I get that, if I get my way about it, the final presentation will get the best decision. That would be uh, uh, oh, oh. Okay. Let's Can I also thank you because I don't know if you remember, but I so I switched to Cam with Gmail last Thursday. Did you really? And for, and I previously had everything forwarded to my app. So I get this message on Friday. I don't know anything, and so my mom somehow gets a call from me and I am. So I'm glad you didn't just like kick me out immediately. Yeah, well, we go. We we started. Well, we saw there was there was there was a number of people who didn't respond. On one. So we started calling. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I had no idea. I didn't get emails for a week and a half. Yeah. I had no well, that's part of the survey. You have to think about the survey. Just uh, send me an email about how you felt, and if you are at a person whose project product, should I remove it as a product? So you're, so you're writing your names earlier. Yeah, she didn't know. Okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to end the hangout. <laughs> <laughs> 